It's a pleasure for the ocean sciences section in conjunction with the atmospheric sciences section to uh, add each. We honor a person who, as an educator and a scientist, was very successful at conveying to the public a concern for the ocean and a concern for the impact of human society on the Earth. We also today honor uh, Susan Lozier, the speaker. Susan started out in chemical engineering getting a uh, bachelor's at Purdue and a master's at the University of Washington. Fortunately, somewhere in there she saw the light and changed to oceanography and got her PhD in 1989. Since then, she's had fellowships at NTAR and at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. She has been the uh, Truman and Nellie Siemens Chair at Earth and Ocean Sciences at Duke, and she is now an associate so we're very fortunate today to have Susan here to talk about uh, the role of the North Atlantic Ocean in climate change. You know, we as a society are grappling with uh, climate variability and climate change. And I think we as oceanographers uh, now more so than ever have a responsibility to speak up and speak clearly about the role of the ocean in climate variability on the earth. So it's a great honor for me to introduce Susan as a speaker following, following in the legacy of Rachel Carson uh, to give her talk about pathways and the climate of the deep North Atlantic Ocean. So let's give Susan a hand, a welcome. Susan's going to talk for about an hour and then we'll follow up with some questions. Thank you, Bob, for your kind words. When Bob asked me several weeks ago to send pictures of myself in action as an oceanographer. I realized that most of my time at sea since graduate school has been spent on various field trips in the coastal waters off um, Beaufort, North Carolina. Uh, these same waters were the source of inspiration to Rachel Carson almost 60 years ago. In the late 1940s, Rachel Carson spent time at the Duke University Marine Lab, which is located in Beaufort. Um, and now, in her honor, um, is located just within shouting distance of the lab is the Rachel Carson National um, Estuarine Reserve. In this coastal region of quiet beauty, uh, Ms. Carson research material for her book, The Sea Around Us, which was published 50 years ago this summer, but she also found a poetic voice for the book. Um, years later, when asked about the lyrical nature of her prose in that book, uh, Ms. Carson responded, um, if there is poetry in my book about the sea, it is not because I deliberately put it there, but because no one could write thoughtfully or truthfully about the sea and leave out the poetry. I think each of us who studies the ocean understands well this blend of science and poetry. And when I take my students out on these field trips, I'm hoping they experience not just the science of the sea, but also its majesty and its poetry. I know myself I've learned a lot on these field trips, including the answer to a much debated question when I was in graduate school. As a student was preparing for oral exams, the rest of graduate students would debate on hours about what the most difficult question would be that we would be asked. So we would wonder if it would be, um, if, the, um, if there were oceans on Neptune, would they be western boundary intensified? Or if the ocean were made of molten lead, how long would it take for a tropical or for a, a Rossby wave or Kelvin wave to travel across the tropical Pacific? Or always a favorite was, when do you expect to graduate? So the list went um, on and on. Um, and even though I spent those years at the University of Washington and was surrounded by physical oceanographers at Woods Hole, it wasn't until I arrived at Duke that I came face to face with the most physical question that a physical oceanographer could be asked. So I was a new professor with my first class of about 80 non-science majors on my first field trip. And we were steaming offshore in the RV Susan Hudson and we were on our way to do some CTD work. And along the way, we took a trawl. And no sooner had the catch come up on board and placed on the culling board and the student turned to me and said, Professor Lozier, what kind of fish is that? <laughs> So, um, now Rachel, which brings me to a theme of my talk, which is that some questions are answerable and others are less so. Now, Rachel Carson, as a marine biologist, would have had more of a go at that question than I did. I did manage to say with a fair degree of confidence that it was a small silver fish. But Rachel Carson had many questions of her own, and her books are peppered with questions. 
And these questions were really born from her keen senses and her keen mind. Um, years ago, my graduate advisor told me to measure my progress not so much by the amount of work done, but how the nature of my questions changed through time. And I've kept this in mind through the years, especially uh, when it seems as though I haven't been getting that much work done. And I use it also as a theme in a, in a course I teach each spring to Duke freshmen. And this course is entitled Ancient and Modern Perceptions of Our Natural World. And in that course, we sort of examine how man's um, ideas since the birth of civilization and questions that he's been asking about the natural world have changed. And to give you an idea of that, I thought I'd share with you some questions that were posed by Adelard of Bath in the early 12th century. Adelard of Bath lived um, during the reign of Henry I of England. And as a naturalist, he wrote a treatise he called On the Nature of Things, in which he speculated about many mysteries of the world in that early 12th century. Um, some of the questions that Adelard asked included, do beasts have souls? Why is joy the cause of weeping? Do the stars fall as they seem to fall? Why do men universally die? And then after those very weighty questions, he moves on somewhere around 76 to start asking questions about the ocean. And the questions about the ocean that he posed in the early 12th centuries were, how does the ocean move? Why are the waters of the sea salty? Whence comes the ebb and flow of the tides? And how does the ocean not increase from the influx of rivers? So we have come some ways in understanding the workings of the ocean and also understanding the workings of our whole natural world in this past millennium. But what questions define us at the brink of this new millennium? While man has always wondered about the natural world and the workings of the natural world, today we face for the first time the question of our large-scale and long-term impact on our own environment. So all of us who study the skin of the earth, whether it's the ocean, the atmosphere, or the terrestrial remain, understand well this human impact on our environment, especially those who study the um, terrestrial and, and marine ecosystems where our impact is so readily apparent. But another issue but that's much less settled is our impact on our global climate system. But to understand the human impact on our global climate system, we need to understand the global climate system. So this afternoon or this evening, what I'd like to do is sort of take a, a slice of that global climate system, namely the ocean, and talk about the ocean's role um, in this climate, and then talk about the challenges we face in trying to decipher the climate signals that we see um, in the deep ocean. So our framework for understanding the ocean's role in the climate cycle is the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. I hesitate to put this up mainly because even my freshmen at Duke sort of roll their eyes when I put this up as if they've been looking at this since, you know, middle school or something. Um, so we all uh, have somewhat of an idea of this great ocean conveyor belt. But what many might not know is that this framework is um, over 200 years old. And it really stemmed from a puzzle about the deep sea based on some measurements that were taken in 1751. And it was during that year that Reverend Stephen Hales um, of England asked a captain of a British slave trader named Henry Ellis to take some measurements of the deep ocean. So prior to that, temperature measurements had been made quite often at the sea surface, but no deep ocean temperatures had been made or at least hadn't been recorded. And so Captain Ellis, on his um, transit uh, to um, Africa, complied, and when he was in the tropical waters, he took some measurements of the deep ocean, and in a letter back um, to Reverend Hales, he described his measurements. And he wrote, upon the passage, I made several trials with the bucket sea gauge. I charged it and let it down to different depths when I discovered by a small thermometer of Fahrenheit that the cold increased regularly in proportion to the depth, till at 3,900 feet the mercury recorded 59 degrees, and though I afterwards sunk it to the depth of 5,346 feet, the thermometer came up no, no lower. So what, what uh, Ellis was essentially describing is what we know today as a thermocline, and he was describing that remarkable quality that the deep ocean is very cold everywhere, polar regions in the tropics. But Ellis wasn't really that impressed with the science. He really was sort of more interested in the practical uh, concerns of finding cold water, because later in his letter he wrote, this experiment, which seemed at first mere food for curiosity, became in the interim very useful to us. By its means, we supplied our cold baths and cooled our wines or waters at pleasure, which is vastly agreeable to us in this burning climate. <laughs> so Hales wasn't um, that much interested in the science either, but he did his duty as well and forwarded these uh, findings to the Royal Society in London, 
where for 50 years later, Count Rumford puzzled on this um, observation and thinking about how those waters could be so cold, knowing that the atmosphere that's overlying those tropical waters never got that cold. Count Rumford wrote, it appears to me to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to account for this degree of cold at the bottom of the sea in the torrid zone on any other supposition than that of cold currents from the pole. So essentially what he was describing is our conveyor belt. And our conveyor belt is essentially of the ocean's uh, convection cell, a product of the differential heating of the Earth, where the cold um, waters descend in the polar regions and being denser than any other waters spread to the rest of the global basin and they are upwelled. And then to complete the cycle, we have the return uh, in the surface of those waters. This conveyor belt has been seen in action quite dramatically over the past decades with the use of uh, chemical tracers, specifically with chlorofluorocarbons that were introduced in the 50s and also with the byproducts of the bond testing that was conducted in the North Atlantic, uh, um, with, uh, especially with the tritium and helium-3. So the geochemists have been able to successfully trace um, the input of these tracers at the surface and then we have seen how these tracers have been um, moved along through the conveyor belt increasingly uh, in the North Atlantic. So that was a change that was imposed at the sea surface that was brought to the depths by the, um, by the conveyor belt. And now we have recent evidence that was shown just last spring by uh, Levitas and colleagues that um, there appear to be the changes of heat at the surface appear to be brought to ocean depths by the conveyor belt. So what I'm showing in this um, slide um, is the time series from, from Levitas's work uh, showing over the 50 years how the heat content of each of these ocean, ocean basins has changed. So I'll just draw your attention first to the um, world ocean, which is in the lower right-hand corner. Thank you. Oh, okay. That will work better, won't it? Okay. Yeah, there we go. Draw your attention to the world ocean here in the lower right-hand corner where we see um, an increase over that 50 years. And according to uh, Levitt, 69 percent of the variance in the heat content um, is accounted for by this linear trend. But what I really wanted to talk about was the uh, results for the North Atlantic here. And the reason is because in uh, this work, what they found was that it, the North Atlantic was the only basin where there was a significant change in the heat content down to 3,000 meters. So all the basins had heat content changes down to 1,000 meters over the 50 years, but it was only in the North Atlantic that the warming was down to, to significant depths. And so clearly this implicates the conveyor belt in its role in taking those, those heat changes, heat content changes at the surface and removing them to depth. Um, the, what possibly could cause this warming was answered in a study um, or was addressed in a study by uh, Tim Barnett and others at Scripps Institute. And what they looked at was uh, they took a global climate model coupled ocean and atmosphere and they forced it with greenhouse gas emissions and also our um, sulfate aerosol emissions. And they looked at the model response and compared that to the ocean in terms of the changes um, in the temperature um, and how those changes um, were, were made with time. So what um, they're showing here are the differences in the uh, North Pacific and the North Atlantic. So first I'll draw your attention to the lower panels, uh, which shows the North Pacific Ocean. And the thing that's uh, remarkable there, not only in that the model matches the observed, but the main thing I want to point out is in the North Pacific, the changes are just in the, in the thermocline waters. And so what we expect there is that changes are, are um, being imposed just by basically top-down processes. Whereas in the North Atlantic, both in the observed and the model, as we move through time from the 50s to 2000, we see that not only those surface waters are being warmed, but there's an intrusion of warmth at depth. And so this implicates um, not just the conveyor belt, but also implicates the anthropogenic forcing um, in, the, um, in the warming. Although what the authors do say is that the warming is consistent uh, with anthropogenic um, forcing. The, um, our, the human impact on the oceans is not uh, visible just in this introduction of heat, though, but in two years ago, Rick Wanikoff and others um, were able to calculate the anthropogenic CO2 intrusion in our oceans. 
This data comes from a series of cruises along 20 degrees west that were conducted in the early 90s. And there are two different plots here because there's two different methods for um, determining the anthropogenic content. But what I wanted to point out to you was that in the whole North Atlantic, we see a surface um, input of the anthropogenic CO2. But in the high latitudes in the North Atlantic, we see um, an intrusion at depth. And again, this looks as though the ocean is truly acting as a reservoir with the global, with the global um, conveyor belt and that it's taking properties acquired at depth and or at the surface and moving them to depth. So if that wasn't enough to get the ocean up on the uh, marquee, a study just uh, last month that was uh, conducted by Levitas and colleagues sort of came out and said not only should the ocean be on the marquee, but it should have top billing. Uh, because if you, they took the three, um, the three components of the global climate system, the atmosphere, the ocean, and the cryosphere, and they looked at the heat content changes at each of those components over the past 50 years and determined that the ocean had an order of magnitude um, larger, its increase was an order of magnitude larger than the increase in the heat content of the atmosphere or the cryosphere. So the heat content of the ocean came about that increase because of temperature increase and the heat content rise in the atmosphere came about because of heat increase and in the cryosphere it's because of the melting which uh, took up uh, heat and that, in that way it acted as a heat sink. And so in this plot um, is plotted a time series as well of heat content and the ocean curve is in the black and we see a large um, increase over time. The atmosphere are, the, are these gray circles and we see that's quite small compared to the ocean heat content change. The cryosphere was not plotted on this but it was the same order of magnitude as the atmosphere. And then what uh, these authors did further is to see if they could simulate the same heat content change again with the global climate model. And in their study, they ran two different models. The first model, which was blue, was using just anthropogenic forcing, meaning um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and sulfate aerosols. But they found that using that, that it overshot the um, observed heat content increase. And so when they added some of the natural variability that's created by solar variability and volcanic emissions, which was the model two, which is shown in red, that they were able to more closely match this heat content change. I will note that they did have a control run where they just um, looked at the natural variability of the ocean and atmosphere system and that couldn't reproduce the, um, the observed change. So for those of us who um, study the deep ocean and are very interested in its role as a climate reservoir, these recent observations uh, bring uh, some very interesting questions. First question is, how are the deep waters of the North Atlantic warming? So not how so much whether it's anthropogenically forced or forced by natural variability, but just how is that heat moving through the North Atlantic? Um, does it involve heat just moving along the boundary currents or is the interior ventilated? And to the extent that we need to know um, how the ocean is a reservoir, we need to know how much of that ocean um, is ventilated. How long until the South Atlantic warms at depth? So we need to understand about time scales um, in the ocean, both mixing and invective time scales at depth. How will the warming affect the deep circulation? So unlike the passive tracers, when we start moving temperature and have temperature changes at depth, because the deep ocean is driven by density changes, then we're going to expect some circulation changes at depth. And then also, how will changes at depth feed back to the surface? Um, and I'll touch on that a little later um, in my talk. So in order to answer these questions, um, we need to really sort of fall back on our observational base. Even though oceanography, like many sciences, sort of follows the progression from observations to understanding to prediction, and even though we're sort of on our way to prediction, uh, we still really are learning quite a bit um, from the observations. And oceanography has a very rich history of observations, and particularly the North Atlantic has a rich history, situated as it is between the United States and Europe. And what I just wanted to highlight um, was the year of the IGY, which I'm proud to say was the year of my birth. Um, and these cruises are particularly significant because they sort of have provi provided um, a basis for understanding how the ocean has changed um, over some 40 or 50 years. And we can't really underestimate the importance that those early, early oceanographers um, had on our um, oceanography today as they collected data station by station. 
And so in the Fugler-Sir Atlas are um, many pictures of art of these salinity and temperature sections. And they provided a, um, have provided a, a rich history for us. And with these, not just an IGY year, but many other cruises, uh, Bill Schmitz at Woods Hole several years ago was able to modify the conveyor belt. So we're able to look at it. Um, it's still a schematic, but we're able to sort of look at some more details. And by understanding the different properties in the different oceans, we're sort of able to figure out the pieces of this con conveyor belt. But still, in the 1995, we're still looking at that conveyor belt as two-dimensional. And so what I want to talk to you about today is really the three-dimensionality of that conveyor belt. So several years ago, uh, Ruth Curry and, and Brett Owens and I um, decided to assemble all the historical hydrographic data in the North Atlantic and start looking at the pathways, the three-dimensional pathways um, for, the, um, for the deep ocean. And when we decided to do this, we wanted to look at um, the ocean on layers of density surfaces. So density surfaces, um, we chose those because we believe that the flow and properties themselves primarily um, uh, flow and mix along surfaces of constant density. So one of the first things we looked at was how circulation changed with depth. And so what I'm going to be looking at or showing you are some um, different um, uh, circulation patterns um, at different depths. I have for if anybody here is a um, very interested in the density numbers, those are first. But for those of you who really sort of prefer where you or want to know where you are in terms of pressure space, uh, those numbers are, are listed um, in the parentheses. The main thing I wanted to say here is that in the upper ocean, we know that we have a wind-driven gyre. So I'm, I'm plotting pressure on a density surface, but we can think of these approximately as flow lines. Um, and then as you go down at the base of the thermocline, that wind-driven gyre weakens. But what appears when you go down even deeper are broader, much broader recirculations um, that are driven by the instability of the Gulf Stream that lies above. And then at depths um, even lower, we get recirculations that are much smaller in nature because these are topographically constrained. So the main point is, though, that when we go down deep, our circulation is not just driven by boundary current here along the western boundary, but that we have um, interior, or we have recirculations um, attached to the boundary current. And these recirculations, what I want to show you, are very important in terms of our uh, climate signals. Um, oh, let me go back. I want to say one other point about that. One of the things that's important about the recirculations then is that the conveyor belt then is not just moving um, in a single manner from the subpolar region to the subtropical region. So it looks as though there's alternate pathways via these recirculations or large scale gyres for signals to move from the subpolar to subtropical regions. And so uh, this is also illustrated in a study done by Kara Lavender and others. Um, last year when they looked at float displacements, and these are displacements over 30 days, and they found that actually very few of the floats move from around the Flemish cap, cap directly in that deep western boundary current. Instead, a number of floats uh, moved eastward and then moved into the subtropical gyre. So we're getting this picture of a ventilation of the interior uh, from hydrography and also um, from floats. So what impact can this have on the um, um, on our interpretation of tracers and other climate signals. If we look at this downstream change in tracer age that's adapted from uh, Doney and Jenkins, they took a, uh, sections that were made along the boundary current at various places and they made a composite uh, downstream section. And so this is density space and they're plotting age of the water. Um, and essentially what you see is that you move downstream, you get uh, waters that are much older or you get waters that increase in age, which makes sense because this is measuring the time since the water was at the surface. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is that that increase in age is much more rapid at this, where this black line is than at the um, top black line and the lower black line. And one thing to say about the age is that physical oceanographers just based on current meters alone would say that it takes only two or three years for signals to get from the subpolar region to the subtropical region. But based on these tracer ages, we realize that there either is a lot of mixing going on or there's an alternate pathway for the tracers to get into the gyre. And in fact, that's exactly what the recirculations are providing. And if you look then um, at CFC sections uh, that were taken 
at these locations, what you see is that, that at that depth where there are large recirculations are present, uh, that we get really uh, very low values for the um, tracer concentrations, which would correlate with large ages. And the reason is those recirculations are mixing waters from the boundary and also able to bring waters in from other pathways. So the main point here is that our interpretation of the, of the climate signals or of the signal in this case from tracers, um, if we look at depth and see different signals, it isn't necessarily because of changes at the sea surface, but really we have dynamically different things going on with depth and we need to take that into consideration. So our the long sh shot of this is that our tritium distribution with depth and other tracers are not just uh, going down the boundary currents, but that they really are being ventilated in the interior by these large-scale um, recirculations. Now, is what we've learned about uh, tracers transferable to heat or salinity? Um, it would be nice if we could say that so, but these tracers are really passive. Um, and when we move into something like heat or salinity and potential vorticity, which is one of my favorite tracers, um, these are really dynamic tracers. And as I said earlier, um, they have the ability to change the circulation. And when you change the circulation, then you start changing um, advective pathways and perhaps diffusive pathways as well. So it really isn't transferable, uh, what we've learned about the passive tracers to dynamic tracers. Uh, the other caveat I want to make is that if we're looking, we're looking here at different property distributions in the North Atlantic, temperature, salinity, oxygen, potential vorticity at a depth of about 1,800 meters. And they're all, they all, except for temperature and salinity, they have to have the same distribution because they're density compensating. But otherwise, every um, property has a different distribution. And that's, even though the invective pathways are the same, um, there's different source sink distributions and perhaps there's differences in mixing. And so our interpretation of what uh, property change there is at depth with one property uh, might be different. Our interpretation of how things are changing the sea surface based on one property distribution at depth uh, might be different than um, the interpretation based on another property. One thing I also want to remark though is about this feedback to the surface. Um, modeling studies, especially by Mike Spall and Woods Hole, have shown that when you start introducing um, um, slugs of Labrador seawater or variability of Labrador seawater, you start changing the uh, Gulf Stream system and its variability even in the surface waters. You, have, you can start changing the separation latitude. Um, and so in this way, um, we don't really have to rely on the feedback to the surface by the conveyor belt going all the way around and finally those waters upwelling to the surface that there are a lot of, there's a lot of short circuiting that can go on because once you start changing the heat or salts or density stratification at depth, you start changing the circulation at depth and that can feed back to the surface as well. Okay, we have sort of really focused on subpolar to subtropical um, signatures or, or signals, but really our interpretation of the climate signals at depth in the North Atlantic has to account for all of our water masses that are moving at depth. Um, and we also have water masses that are moving in from the south, like Antarctic bottom water and Antarctic in intermediate water. But one I just wanted to highlight briefly was the um, Mediterranean water that flows into the North Atlantic over the Strait of Gibraltar. So this Mediterranean water has long interested oceanographers because of its um, influx of salt um, into um, the North Atlantic. And many have postulated that one of the reasons the North Atlantic uh, source waters in high latitudes are preconditioned to sinking um, is the input of this salt from the Mediterranean uh, from the Mediterranean Sea. You know, can I ask someone to maybe turn down the lights just a little bit so they're not so washed out? Do you mind? Is that possible? I went to all this trouble to make these signs. And I want to make sure they look right. See? So you could just turn out. I don't know if that's possible or not. OK, thank you. Maybe it's the slides, not the lights. All right, so the, um, the, in, the, lar the largest uh, question about this uh, Mediterranean water, though, is where does the salt go and what is its impact? Um, basically, where it goes, because we're interested in um, its signal um, at depth. And so using this high-density hydrography, we were able to um, 
track the flow of the Mediterranean waters out of the Strait of Gibraltar to find out where that salt is going. Um, and so these are just cross sections um, showing the um, details of the med water here, which um, is hugging the coast. And as we start moving uh, westward, we are able to track that salt tongue. And so what we were able to find is sort of shown in this composite in that the salt pathways for the Mediterranean, there are some pathways mainly from eddies into the western basin, or into the, excuse me, the eastern part of the subtropical basin, but that also there was a strong uh, pathway for salt up to the northern um, part of the North Atlantic. And in fact, using this um, hydrographic data, we were able to come up with a circulation field which also showed that this salt was carried up to high latitudes. Now, there are sort of two issues here. One point that I want to make is that if the salt is carried up to high latitudes, that means that at high latitudes, changes at depth are not just due to changes at the surface at high latitudes, that it's possible that there's variability from the med sea waters that's affecting changes at depth in subpolar regions. And this um, is nicely illustrated by some floats that Amy Bauer and Tom Rossby um, released a few years ago in the Northeast Atlantic. And I want to point out about the red floats that um, Amy tracked, that these are leaving the eastern boundary, or these are, excuse me, um, were launched along the eastern boundary, presumably at the core of the, of the uh, Mediterranean waters. And we see that they are moving into subpolar regions. Some of them move in the Rockhaw Trough, but some of them move up into the Icelandic Basin. So uh, we have subpolar waters moving down to subtropical, but apparently we also have uh, the other, the other um, happening, the other venue happening as well. The other question that's sort of um, open is the impact of these Mediterranean waters directly on the source waters for the um, North Atlantic deep waters. It's still sort of an open question whether they directly affect the source waters, hence making them salty, or whether they indirectly um, affect them by mixing um, with the North Atlantic central waters. But the main point I wanted to make, though, is that our climate signal at depth is not just um, focused on uh, subpolar changes. So if we have an idea of these pathways, subpolar to subtropical, subtropical to subpolar, and we have some idea about our property distributions at, at, um, at depth in the, the climatological property distributions, the question is, would be, what is the deep ocean response to climate change imposed at sea surface? So we can we start seeing you know, on these surfaces um, any of these changes that we've talked about. Um, well, there, many people choose to answer this question by looking at models, by looking at ocean climate models. And I just want to add a word um, of caution about this in that um, I've been working with um, E. Chow at JPL um, and looking at comparisons of these um, deep ocean or these ocean models to some of the observations. And to my knowledge, there if these models, these climate models that have been run to equilibrium, um, have not been able to successfully re reproduce the known water mass structure of the ocean. So this is the NCAR uh, climate ocean model. And um, this is the structure of the deep ocean when the model's at equilibrium. And this is the uh, cross section at 35 west um, of the ocean from the Levitas data. So this is from observations. This is from the model. And you see we have this rich water mass uh, history in the um, in the data in that we have North Atlantic deep water sinking and moving southward. We have a penetration of Antarctic intermediate water. We have Antarctic bottom water. We have med waters. So basically, we really have no water mass structure in these um, large scale, these climate models. And for those of us who sort of um, have a strong belief in these water masses and that climate signals are um, moving with these water masses, it's a little hard to um, sort of accept these models um, as um, let's see what I can say, as being um, very specific um, in terms of how the water, how these changes are being introduced uh, to the deep ocean. But I think um, this is sort of um, akin to people lie on both sides of this issue, and I think it's sort of akin to debate that might go on between two baseball fans. One person might say, well, all you need to do to sort of figure out who could, who's going to win the game is look at the rosters. And you just look at that lineup, and you're going to kind of be able to tell who has the sluggers or the pitcher or whatever, and um, you might be able to figure that out. On the other camp might say, well, I don't think so. I think you're going to have to play the game, you know, because you have to play that game inning by inning, 
play by play, pitch by pitch. You can't just look at the rosters. But it might be that um, both are true because um, you might have to play the game in the short term. Otherwise, it's hard to, it would be hard to understand how those Mariners could be having playing, or be playing 750 ball now. But in the long term, it might be um, that the roster is enough. And so we might be uh, spending October again watching those Yankees in the World Series. So if we weren't going to um, rely just on the models to tell us about, these are really washed out and I apologize. If we weren't going to rely just on the models to tell us about how the ocean is changing, we can look at our observations and sort of think about simple dynamical or think about the dynamical consistency of the, of the signals and what we would expect. And so one main thing is do we expect signals to be top down or do we expect signals to be imported by the conveyor belt? And surely from what I've been saying all the way through this talk, you would expect now that I'm going to be talking about the importance of that conveyor belt. And if you could see this overhead, what you would see is that um, this is a time series of temperature changes in the eastern North Atlantic from uh, the surface to the depth. And what you would see is that there's very little variability over time in the surface waters, but there's very large variability centered right on where the Met outflow is. So at least in that eastern part of the Atlantic, the variability, the large scale changes that are going on are right at the depth of that uh, convected water mass, not, at surf, uh, not, at, not in the surface waters at all, five years, and depth. One is, since with the picnic levels, it's important for us to do that because it gives us some idea about the mechanism of this change. So Bryden uh, talked about this warming and he said that it, um, at 24 north over this period of 40 some odd years, um, the heaving of isopycnals, the deepening, was really responsible for the main warming, but also this warming that was concentrated at 1,000 meters here, right here, that that was because of temperature and salinity or water mass variability that was at the level of the Mediterranean water, which is also the same as the level of Antarctic and immediate water. Uh, these same results were found by Joyce et al. in their reoccupation of a section at, at 52 west, which is shown here. They, when they differenced, um, their results from the WOS section to the IGY section, and they integrated them along the, uh, the section, and we're looking at changes with depth. They found that the largest changes occurred at 1,000 meters, that level of the Mediterranean water. And here they're looking at the water mass changes from the three different cruises. This is plotting uh, potential temperature and salinity. So the overall message from these cruises was that there is a deepening of the isopycnals to produce an overall warming, but there also appear to be water mass changes at the level of, of, of Mediterranean. So both these authors, though, talked about the, how their um, conclusions were really restricted because they have a slice in space, and they also have just several slices in time. But, and really what's needed to understand these climate signals is to put them in the context of a space and time continuum. So what I um, have worked on uh, recently um, is trying to do just that, trying to look at these um, temperature and salinity changes in a, in a broader context. So we do have a Levitas' work that gives us volume average numbers, but what I'm trying to do is to say, well, what, do we have enough data that we can look more closely um, on these surfaces and see where it's warming and sort of look for dynamical consistency, see if there's any coherent signature. So I've been working with a statistician um, at Duke and learning a lot of new language in the process of doing this. And um, one of the things we did was divided up our North Atlantic. This is a statistician's ideas of coastlines, by the way. So this is Africa, and this is South America, and this is uh, North America, Newfoundland. And so since you can't read this very well, we're looking at longitude here and latitude. So the range goes from 0 to 65 and 0 uh, to 85 uh, west. And then each uh, square here represents a portion of the ocean. And then what, that, what we're plotting in each portion of the ocean, it's about a 7 degree by 7 degree bend, is actually an individual time series. So for this particular square, this is this axis is time and this is temperature. So we're looking at how the temperature is changing. And this database that I'm using now, uh, thanks to the efforts of Ruth Curry at, at Woods Hole, um, includes all the uh, National Oceanic Data Center data and all the data that's from the Los Cruises, and so it's current up to June of 2000. So the first thing I want you to um, just understand is the amount of data 
So some people might think this looks like a lot of data, and others might think it, it doesn't look like much. But it just shows you um, that not only do we have um, changes in data density in different places of the ocean, we also have some very serious uh, quality control problems. Like I look here, and it sort of looks like a black smoker to me, um, what's going on here. But um, the main, what I have shown here, though, is we've looked at a linear regression. So we've said that at each spatial bend in the ocean on this surface, which is at 1,000 meters, which is where the Mediterranean outflow waters are, do we see any consistent warming? And so I have honestly shaded some of these squares red and some of these squares blue, but it's not really that apparent. The uh, blue squares all up here in the um, subpolar region really represent where there has been significant cooling. And the red squares um, that are shaded red are where there's been um, significant warming. And so the white is where you can't distinguish between warming or cooling or, or nothing happening at all. So what I will tell you is that in the subpolar regions, there's significant uh, cooling at the surface, but only at a few locations in the subtropical uh, region can we really see over this um, essentially 100-year or 90-year time series can we see significant warming. So we don't really see strong water mass variability at that depth. However, when we move down to the uh, level of the Labrador seawater, what we see is a significant large increase in the um, number of spatial bins that are actually cooling um, on this isopycnal surface. And so we have some isolated ones that are, that are warming, but overall this is a large area that's cooling at that um, depth of the Labrador seawater. So I did this for several surfaces. and. Um, it appears as though in terms of water mass characteristics that near the surface at 5,000 meters, we do see um, more warming and cooling. So I'm showing the histogram. I'm distributing the uh, number, looking at the number of spatial bends that are warming, and those are shown in red, which is now pink. And then those that are cooling is now shown by the blue. So it, at 500 meters, we actually do have more bends that are warming than are cooling on these density surfaces. At 1,000 meters, um, there's actually more bends that are cooling than are warming. Um, but really, overall, there isn't a statistically significant um, difference in the surfaces as, an, as, an, as a whole. But when you get down to 1,500 meters and 2,200 meters and below, those isopycnal surfaces are significantly cooling. Now, what I want to make clear is that a cooling, if I did this for salinity, I would have everything look exactly the same except it would be freshening. So because there's density compensation on those isopycnal surfaces. So what these results are showing is that in the deep ocean, um, starting around 1,500 meters and down, there's been a significant cooling and freshening on isopycnal surfaces. So how does that make sense then that Levitas has been showing that we've been having a warming um, overall in the ocean at depth, at least down to 3,000 meters? Um, well, because the, the main mechanism that is producing that warming then is the heaving, is the deepening of the isopycnals. And so in this analysis of this data that goes up to year 2000, the, the signal that's the most, that has the most uh, significance of the strongest signal has really been a very large-scale deepening of isopycnals. And so plotted in green in this plot at this depth of 1,500 meters, all of these are green except for these few that are orange. This shows significant deepening of the, um, of the thermocline, or excuse me, of these waters below the thermocline. So if we looked at a histogram of the pressure changes with time on these isopycnal surfaces, um, what we find is, in fact, it's true even at 500 meters, that we have now in pink, this shows where these, um, the number of bends where the isopycnal is, um, is deepening. And what we find is that as we go down, we get very, very significant um, deepening of those isopycnals. And in fact, here at 2,000 meters, we get um, the movement, the slope of that changes on the order of 270 meters over 100 years. And this is consistent with, with, with what Joyce found, uh, which is basically a rate of about two meters per year. So the um, overall change then that we're seeing um, in the North Atlantic is um, 
or should say the overall climate change appears to be sort of um, of two two uh, natures. One is it. Um, Instead of just thinking about the warming at high latitudes and having that warmth imported, it appears as though the freshening at high latitudes because of the increased uh, melting is really creating a freshening of our deep waters. That that signal seems to be more important or overriding changes in the heat content of the surface waters uh, in the subpolar latitude. So overall, it seems as though that that freshening is being imported to the deep waters um, of the North Atlantic, but that this heaving may simply be a result of that the surface waters in the subtropical, there's just more of them. Um, and so that that volume of those uh, warmer waters and, and also just warmer waters actually is creating um, a deepening of those colder isopycnals. So we, uh, this work obviously is, um, is in progress and we're just beginning to sort of look crudely um, at spatial maps of climate change and really just trying to say, can we say anything significant other than um, looking at volume averages or looking at station by station. And so hopefully what we'll be able to do is sort of figure out um, the roots of these, of this heat so that we can work toward an understanding of the, um, of the reservoir that the uh, North Atlantic provides. So in conclusion, the deep North Atlantic pathways allow for ventilation in the ocean interior. So this is very important when we think about the extent to which the ocean is going to act as a reservoir. The deep pathways include not only subpolar to subtropical pathways, but also the other way around. And when we start interpreting climate signals at depth, we need to understand that um, we have uh, these signals coming from different places. Changes in dynamic tracers um, at depth can feed back to the surface waters. And then finally, what I just talked about is that the analysis of the historical hydrographic data shows cooling and freshening on those deep isopycnals but the overall signal of the warming in the, in the Atlantic um, Ocean, or the North Atlantic Ocean, is really um, a result of the deepening of those um, ice signals over a very uh, large area. So though I have uh, sort of ended with uh, conclusions here, to be honest, I really um, have a lot more questions than answers about um, the deep uh, Atlantic climate signals. But I think that's the way of it with almost um, any climate studies these days. It's rather like a puzzle. I often think trying to decipher this uh, global climate system and trying to figure out how our global climate system is evolving is akin to trying to tell time by looking at the back of a grandfather clock. So by studying, we may be able to figure out how one particular gear functions or how one small cog moves or how a particular weight hangs and swings. But how the whole thing fits together, the big picture, is really, um, it's really quite elusive. But someday, and maybe someday soon, we may all, um, that picture may fit together, and we may all share a sentiment that was expressed by Isaac Newton over 300 years ago when his laws of uh, motion fell into place. And he wrote, I seem to then only like a boy playing on the seashore, diverting myself now and then, finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. So in conclusion, having been given this um, opportunity to present the Rachel Carson le lecture, I would be remiss if I did not spend a few moments as an advocate for the care of our ocean, our earth, our atmosphere. Um, Rachel Carson um, also wrote The Silent Spring um, in addition to The Sea Around Us. And years ago, I read Silent Spring as a history book, and I've assigned it to my students through the years as a history book. But when, in that book, when Rachel Carson wrote, the rapidity of change and the speed with which new situations are created follow the impetuous and heedless pace of man rather than the deliberate pace of nature. And when she wrote, no one knows what the results will be because we have no previous experience to guide us. These aren't just words um, from a time past. Though Ms. Carson was talking about the unbridled use of pesticides in the mid-20th century, these words ring true to us today as we consider our impact on our own environment. Though we may be out of harm's way in terms of DDT and other pesticides, uh, we live in a world today where a major portion of our land is transformed by um, human activity, biogeochemical cycles are altered, ecosystems are threatened, half of our surface fresh water is cycled by uh, humanity, and something that would really dismay Rachel Carson were she alive today, two-thirds of major marine fisheries um, are overexploited or depleted. 
these changes um, bring many choices to us as a society. And another marine biologist in 1998 spoke of these choices that we face. Uh, Jane Lubchenco, in her presidential address to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, um, uh, spoke about these choices. And her, the title of her address was Entering the Century of the Environment, a New Social Contract for Science. And in her remarks, she said, many of the choices facing society are moral and ethical ones, and scientific information can inform these. However, the role of science in informing decisions is one of the critical unmet needs at the end of the millennium. A better understanding of the likely consequences of different policy options will allow more enlightened decisions. Dr. Lepchenko goes on to encourage scientists to address the unmet um, needs that are brought about by our human impact on our environment, and she encourages scientists to communicate widely the knowledge they've gained. I don't pretend to stand on any high ground on this issue. Um, for years, as I've taught my students about the oceans and the climate and the environment, I've sort of said I deal with just the science. But as the years have passed, that disclaimer has begun to sound uh, more hollow. And I really don't believe that as scientists or as parents or as citizens or as inhabitants of this home we call Earth, that we really can afford much longer to deal with just the science. I believe we have an obligation to advocate lest we lose that natural poetry of our natural world. So my final message to you, as well as a reminder to myself, is that we all follow the legacy that Rachel Carson left us as scientists. And that legacy is to observe, to study, to contemplate, to care, and to act. Thank you.